Today is the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. The epistle is taken from the Mass of the 6th Sunday after Epiphany. From St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1. Brethren, we give thanks to God always and for you all, making a remembrance of you in our prayers without ceasing, being mindful of the work of your faith and labor and charity, and of the enduring of the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved of God, your election, for our gospel has not been unto you in word only, but in power also, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much fullness, as you know what manner of men we have been among you for your sakes. And you became followers of us and of our Lord, receiving the word in much tribulation, with joy of the Holy Ghost so that you were made a pattern to all that believe in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you was spread abroad the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith, which is towards God, is gone forth, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves relate of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised up from the dead, Jesus, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew, chapter 13. At that time Jesus spoke to the multitude this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown up, it is greater than all herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and dwell in the branches thereof. Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of heaven is like to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, until the whole was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke in parables to the the multitudes, and without parables he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden from the foundation of the world. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. After the Mass, there will be a a banquet. All of you are welcome to come. (coughs) And my name is Father David Huco. I was last seven years in Syracuse at a Blessed Virgin Mary Academy and parish. It's a a size of about 700 souls, 400 souls, a growing school. And uh, I'm here in Kentucky, with the priests who are uh, resisting the liberalism invading the Society of St. Pius X, which is a very sad event, this crisis of our dear society. So that brings me here to help these priests to hopefully put ourselves in Our Lady's hands to either the society does a U-turn and continues the principles and the fight of Archbishop Lefebvre and all the previous great saint popes, or to, whatever God wills, begin again, just maintaining the, the principles of our Holy Founder. So pray for this, pray for all the priests, all the priests, pray for the Pope to consecrate Russia. That really is the solution. But... If the Pope ignores Our Lady, what can we do but pray for him? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Lord compares the Church to a mustard seed. And that mustard seed is the Catholic faith that is implanted in all of our souls when we are baptized. I'd like to uh, refer your minds to a great event in history, very similar to our own time. 
and that is when Spain in the late 600s was invaded, totally invaded by the Muslims who came in from uh, northern Africa. They swept all the way up very quickly, invading towns, cities, tearing down the church bells, smashing the crucifixes, and uh, needless to say, the murder of many, many women, children, and priests, and men. This invasion spread very fast, and by the early 700s, Spain was basically Muslim. And only in the northern regions, in the mountains, the Asturias Mountains, there remained a small remnant led by Palayo, who was a friend and disciple of a, a great holy monk who lived in the mountains there in a cave. And this cave today is known as Covadonga. It's a magnificent cave. They, actually, there's a monastery built there. Uh, I got to go there with some priests, and we said Mass on the altar that St. Anthony Mary Claret said Mass on in that cave. Palayo, who was the great general to resist, he, he's buried there, and um, it's, it's in the mountains. And underneath the cave is a huge waterfall, which I'm sure the soldiers had a good time uh, jumping off and swimming in during their stay there. But this holy monk saw the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary told him that her protection is over them and that with her help they will win many battles. And therefore there is honored there the Virgin Mary of Covadonga. It's a magnificent statue of Our Lady dressed in uh, beautiful vestments. So Palayo, uh, he gathered together it says a small band of soldiers, some think up to a thousand, some say as low as three hundred. But whatever the number was, it wasn't very much. And the Muslims were threatening to come in and invade. And Palayo uh, was visited by Bishop Opas. Bishop Opas was a perfect Vatican II bishop. He came and he said to uh, the general Palayo, he shouted out to him at the mouth of the cave. He said, Palayo. He shouted out his name, Palayo. And Palayo knew this bishop. He said, yes, Bishop Opas, what do you want? And Bishop Opas, he said, look, the whole country is Muslim. The whole city has given in. Save your life, save your soldiers, and just make a peace treaty with these Muslims, and all will go well. And Palayo said in these words, and you will try to convince us with your shameless words to abandon our stand and enjoy many benefits alongside the Muslims. All Spain must be Catholic. We will never accept a pagan Spain or a compromise with infidels. How could you be so bold as to think we could trust you when you have already betrayed the Catholic banner, the Catholic cause. And Bishop Opas, the compromiser, he told Palayo, he said, don't worry, the, the fight is useless. You might as well give up, lay down your weapons. How can you expect to win with a handful against 60,000 trained Muslim soldiers? You're going to lose, Palayo. And Palayo then referred to this gospel of today's Mass. He said, Haven't you read in Scripture that the church of the Lord is like the mustard seed, which, small as it is, grows more than any other through the mercy of God? And Bishop Opas said to him, But you ought to imitate those who have submitted and escaped slavery and death. You can live. Save your life. And Palayo said these great words, which still echo from that cave today. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. From this mountain will come the salvation of Spain and the people of the Goths. The mercy of Christ will free us from that multitude. Go home, Don Opas, and take this message to the enemy of God. 
And the bishop returned to his city, and he said, well, I can't convince these fanatical, uh, crusty, old, doctrinal Bishop, Bishop uh, Palaio and that monk and all his soldiers. This happened in May of the year 722. And in fact, the Muslims did invade, and the Blessed Virgin Mary helped them. She let loose from heaven a downpour, and the, the Muslim soldiers weren't used to fighting in mountains, in brush, and especially in torrential rain. So the description of the battles describe uh, Palayo's soldiers running, to the, running through with their, with their swords, running on foot, leaping over the hills and mountains, while the Muslims on their horses were sliding, sliding and being slaughtered, and uh, being swept away in the torrents from the rain. So Palayo was after that battle, a great battle of a couple days, and through the Virgin Mary they had victory. And he was crowned the first king of Spain. And that began in the year 722 up until 1492, 700 years of the great history of the Reconquista, for to make Spain Catholic again. So our country is still young, and our fight is very fresh. So we can compare this to uh, our dear Archbishop Lefebvre who when he saw during the Vatican Council the hijacking of the Holy Catholic Church by the enemies of Jesus Christ witnessed before his eyes. He saw their expressions. He saw their whispering. He saw the, the laughter of the liberal bishops when, when Cardinal Ottaviani was trying, went over his time. They turned off the speaker and he was in tears begging the Council Fathers, don't go this direction. It will be the destruction of the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre saw these rats, these hyenas, just wreak havoc in the church. But how did they do it? There wasn't a fight, there wasn't bloodshed in, the, in St. Peter's Basilica. It was done by the slick pen, by the slick putting in of ambiguous terminology. And we society priests and bishops... We have all been warned, we have all been trained by St. Pius X and by our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, never use the language of the enemy. We know, like Navy SEAL soldiers, there's a certain pattern of the enemy and you never imitate it. We have been trained, we have been warned, and we must never use their terminology. And yet... We see recently ambiguous terms being used. We see language that can be interpreted in two ways. The light of tradition. Uh, the council is limited. And religious liberty is limited. The council is not so bad. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the quotes, but you can look them up yourself. And it's very, very alarming to us Catholics because language is very important to protect the Catholic doctrine. And we have to understand, dear faithful, the fight is about the faith. It's not about some legalistic uh, exchange. It is a faith at stake. Archbishop Lefebvre understood this. And that's why he alone, against all the bishops, over 2,300 bishops, and Bishop de Castro Mayor with him later, who stood up, and said, we cannot cooperate in the destruction of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And thank the good Lord for Archbishop Lefebvre, who inspired great priests like Father Hannafin, who was your pastor here many years, and Father Snyder, who knew him personally, and so many priests throughout the world who kept the faith, and faithful, who kept the faith, thanks to Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, he died in 91, and our dear society has been piloted by Bishop Fillet. Bishop Fillet used to speak very clearly. He used to tell us 
Never, we can never make a false agreement with Rome. It will be our destruction. He warned Campos in the year 2003, don't make a false agreement with Rome. It'll be your disaster. It'll be a destruction for you. And Bishop Rifan fell. He made the compromise. And now they have the new mass. Now they accept Vatican II. And now it's, it's a mess. It's very sad. And good priests. Dr. White told us he saw good priests battling for the faith. And when this agreement happened, uh, even before the agreement, it was prepared. The priests were already accepting. We have to go under Rome. We have to be united with Rome. And they did, to their destruction of their faith. Why? Because they forgot the great distinction of our holy founder, who, by the way, was a, the greatest theologian of, in, in the last 150 years. And Archbishop Lefebvre made this very simple distinction, which is not being heard anymore from the top of our dear society. And what is that distinction? That Rome now is modernist. Rome now is the conciliar church. It is a new religion, which we refuse to follow because we, re we want to remain Catholic. So the modernist Rome, the conciliar church, must be distinguished from the eternal Rome, the Catholic church of all time. And that's why we don't have to worry, as the Archbishop said, we're not worried about being outside the church. We're not outside the church. You hold the same faith as our fathers. You hold the same doctrine, the same sacraments, the same devotions. And that can't change. Even if Catholics said at St. Athanasius, even if Catholics are re reduced to a handful, they still remain the true Church of Jesus Christ. And as the Virgin Mary of La Salette warned us, those days are coming when the faith will only be found in pockets throughout the world. Farmhouses, families, little missions, little parishes. And we see, we see how this is very possible now. I mean, we see this whole new orientation since July of this year that our dear leaders want to make this agreement. And they're saying, well, it's not going to happen now, it's not going to happen yet, but they want it, and that's what's wrong. We cannot desire a peace treaty with the enemies of Jesus Christ. They are destroying the faith and taking millions of souls to hell at the hands of bishops and priests, and with great, great sadness, by the Pope himself. The Holy Father should hold high the light of the Catholic faith. But what did he do in Assisi just a year ago? You know what he did before the whole world? And invited an atheist if with all these Buddhists, Muslims, Anglicans, you name it. They were all there. Voodooists, Satanists. And an atheist who publicly said, I want to thank Pope Benedict XVI for inviting me to Assisi to represent the non-believers. How could the Pope, if he had the Catholic faith and knows the first commandment, you boys serving Mass, you little kids out there, what's the first commandment? You know, there's only one God and have no false gods before me. And when we see the Pope himself and his the fellow cardinals and bishops, everyone being silent and trampling on Almighty God, a, a trampling on the first commandment. The whole Catholic world should react against this, especially the Society of St. Pius X. And even there we had a weak resistance, which tells you something is seriously wrong from the top. I smell Freemasonry. God knows. They are saying Benedict XVI is changing. They are saying that things are different than from 1988 in Rome. They are saying that we cannot make a Vatican II super heresies. So we got to ask three questions. Why did the Society of St. Pius X get founded in the first place? Why does it exist? Two. What's the difference between Rome and the Society of St. Pius X and this so-called separation of 42 years now? 
And three, has Rome really changed? First, why the Society of St. Pius X in the first place? Why do we exist? It's to protect, to keep the mustard seed in our souls. So you can save your soul and not go to hell. And what is the first attack at Vatican II? It is an attack leveled at the roots. The faith itself is attacked. It's not a question of just changing the vestments and turning the mass around to face the people. Oh, that's bad enough. But it's the faith, Jesus Christ, His divinity, His kingship. The whole faith is under attack. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, we cannot go with this. And you can, I, I say, I beg you, don't just read the Great Declaration of 1974. Don't just read it. Pray it. Meditate it. Get it in your blood. Because it's, it is our defense. It is our, our, our declaration of war against the enemies of Christ. I'll quote a little bit from it for your patience. We hold fast with all our heart and with all our soul to Catholic Rome guardian of the Catholic faith and of the tradition is necessary to preserve this faith to eternal Rome, mistress of wisdom and truth. We refuse, on the other hand, and have always refused to follow the Rome of, here's the distinction, of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies, which were clearly evident in the Second Vatican Council and after the Council, and all the reforms with it which issued from it, and he goes to describe these reforms rooted in modern philosophy and liberalism, condemned many years ago by St. Pius X and Pius IX. And then he goes on to say, no authority, because back then the priests and the faithful were told, you must obey. And the most obedient pastors to their bishops were telling the faithful, I don't like this new Mass, I don't like it, but I have to obey. And they obeyed, and by the obedience, they destroyed many souls and made many Catholics lose their faith. A false obedience. How many nuns, how many priests, because they were obedient, lost their faith, changed their habits, threw off their rosaries and crucifixes, and joined with the world. No authority, not even the highest in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or diminish our Catholic faith so clearly expressed and professed by the Church's Magisterium for 19 centuries. And he quotes the great St. Paul, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you, besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema, let him be condemned. If a priest, a bishop, or even a pope preaches a doctrine different from Catholic tradition, don't listen to him. Keep the faith and oppose, and if you're called disobedient, and a rebel, and non-conforming, blessed are you, our Lord says, when they re revile you for my sake. You fathers who want to raise and your children and keep the faith, and you good mothers, we must fight. We have no choice. God put us now, in these days, and that's why these priests, these pockets of priests, up to about 30 and more throughout the world from the Society of St. Pius X are resisting, are speaking out because we see this, this terrible calamity on the society. And the Society of St. Pius X is the last bastion of the faith. It's the last framework standing up. It's the last column of soldiers fighting. And if that crumbles, we'll see fire from heaven very soon. I, I quote the Archbishop, the Declaration, 74. Is it not this that the Holy Father is repeating us today? And if we can discern a certain contradiction in his words and deeds, as well in the, as in those of the dicasteries, well, we choose what was always taught, and we turn a deaf ear to the novelties destroying the church. And then he goes on, the... And he, he says right in the middle, what we should be doing, what our dear Bishop Follet should be preaching at every place he visits, 
He should be re repeating these words over and over again. Here they are. The only attitude of faithfulness to the church and Catholic doctrine in view of our salvation is a categorical refusal. Refusal to accept this reformation. And that also means any soft-worded agreements that will move us to take an agreement to come under these destroyers of the faith. And Bishop Follet used to speak strongly. Maybe we haven't sanctified our soul enough. Maybe we haven't done enough penance to allow this to happen for our leaders. So why the SSPX? The faith first, then the priesthood, then the salvation of the true Mass, and then to save your souls. So, second question, what's the difference between Rome and the SSPX that there's been this separation for 40 years? Well, it's very clear. The Archbishop told Cardinal Ratzinger, who is this Pope now, he told them in very clear words. He didn't try to uh, use confusing language to, to make Rome smile and think we think like them. It's not true. He was very clear. Here's what he told the Cardinal. You are working to de-Christianize society. You are working to uncrown Christ the King, the human person in the Church. And we the Society of St. Pius X, and traditional Catholics throughout the world, we are working to Christianize them. We cannot get along together. Rome has lost the faith, my dear friends. Rome is an apostasy. I am not speaking empty words. That is the truth. And the proof of Rome's loss of the faith, you almost hit it every week. The pope visit, this Pope has visited the mosque in, in 2006, faced Mecca, did not make the sign of the cross, took his shoes off, and faced Mecca praying uh, with those Muslims. A horrible scandal, going into ma synagogues, praying with the Jews who refused Jesus Christ. The Jews reject Jesus Christ. And we cannot pray with the Jews. We must pray for the Jews to convert to, to Jesus Christ. And this Pope, his, all his efforts towards ecumenism, a CZ3, of course, which was a disaster, worse than a CZ1 and a CZ2, because he appears as the conservative Pope and deceiving many. And many think, because he released the Tridentine Mass, that he's a conservative and he's making gestures towards tradition. It's not true. It's very subtle, very sneaky, and he has expressed at the beginning of his pontificate as John Minari put in his Catholic Family News, that quote at the headlines, that he has successfully made traditional communities fall towards Vatican II. And they're working at us by causing division, by causing dissension, by ambiguous terminology, by uh, pulling the leaders towards this false agreement. And Rome doesn't want the faith right now. It has not changed. Rome has not changed. And in the name of religious liberty, they have tore off from Catholic countries, from Colombia, Spain, Ireland, Philippines in 92, Italy in 1984, tore off, ripped out Jesus Christ from the Constitution. And this promoted by the Vatican itself. And then a year ago, in October, two weeks after Assisi, the Vatican called for a one-world government, a one-world authority, a one-world banking system. What does that sound like? And Pius X said a hundred years ago that the Antichrist is not far off. And when the men of the church are preparing him, it's very frightening. So, the difference is the faith. That's what separates us from modern Rome. We want to keep the Catholic faith. They, do, well, they want to destroy it. And nothing has changed. Has Rome changed? Absolutely not.
This is uh, Dom Fleichmann, a Benedictine in Brazil, a friend of Dom Thomas Aquinas. He said these words, I said in 1988 to Dom Gerard what I repeated to you today, Thousands of faithful anxiously wait for you, Dom Gerard, who made a compromise and agreement with Rome in 1988, and they accepted the new Mass five years later. We wait for you to confirm them in the Catholic faith in the combat that divine providence requires of us without our succumbing to fatigue, weakness, or the siren song of legality. What our Lord requires is, this is for us, all of us, what our Lord requires is martyrdom endured drop by drop and a clear and simple profession of the Catholic faith without compromising with the modernists in the Vatican. The Pope, yes. Legality, yes. But above all, respond to God's clear call to the combat of the faith. The day the Pope really converts, it will appear more clearly than the light of day, obviously. It is not by kissing the Koran or by going to pray in a mosque that he manifests this conversion. And we await, we pray, we fight for the conversion of Rome. But it's not happened. It's far, far from it. And that's why now, dear faithful and society priests, must speak out. And the Virgin Mary complained in Quito. She warned about these days when the sanctuary light will be, will be extinguished, <clears throat> when the faith would be lost at the very highest parts of the church. And many, many souls will go to hell. Virginity, purity will be almost unknown, she said. Priests will become worldly and not speak out against error. She says this three times in the apparitions. Priests will not speak out when they should speak out, and bishops. And this is why this situation now. We have to speak out against a false compromise. We must speak up for all the popes of tradition. Us priests are bound by our anti-modernist oath to speak out, to uphold the position of our dear founder against a slippery compromise and the steps thereto. And already silencing is taking place. Fewer sermons speaking against Vatican II, against the modernism, against the liberalism. And the sheep are being invaded by the wolves. And whose fault will it be? It will be the priests who did not speak out. And you, dear faithful, it's not your place to preach from pulpits, I know, but you fathers, you teach in your home. Foster the faith, first by example, by the love and cherishing of your dear wife. And not to talk down at her like a rug. Hold her high. And you'll teach your boys how to respect and how to love properly the woman that is being torn down to the mud today. It's the father who has to set this example. And the good mother is you, Foster the faith in your home by your loving obedience, by your cheerful teaching of the faith in the smallest things. Johnny scratches his knee. Teach him the children of Fatima's secret to sanctity. Offer it to God for souls. So simple. And to see all in the eyes of the faith and make the Mass the heart of our life and the Catechism to teach it, but not in a boring way, but in a way to each child adaptable to, for them to comprehend and absorb and memorize and get it in their heart and blood. So let us turn to the Virgin Mary to surrender our, the garden of our souls to her, that she weed out our sins, help us root out our sins, and especially guard against false ideas, false liberal ideas. That's why you've got to read the Archbishop Lefebvre Read the encyclicals of the great popes so that the mustard seed in our soul may grow. And in your soul, the my virtue and the charity of God might grow. And the church, the Catholic church, which will revive again after whatever chastisement God unleashes on this wicked world that mocks him, that the church will revive. And that little mustard seed that you are guarding and, and taking care of now 
will blossom again, and the Catholic Church will blossom again with martyrs, with saints, and good and holy mothers and fathers and children. Let's keep our rosary every day. That is our weapon in these days. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.